If you brought your Bibles tonight, I hope you, if you didn't bring your Bible, you can do it online, yeah, like I'm going to. We're going to go to the passage that we read this morning or this afternoon, whenever you read the Bible reading or listen to it. Judges chapter 13. Um, we're in the year of the Bible, as you know, and we're reading together. We're doing soap acrostic together and journaling together hearing from Jesus, reading the same passages together. And this morning and tomorrow, we're going to be reading the life of this guy named Samson. I want to talk to you for just a few minutes tonight about staying spiritually strong. Staying spiritually strong. Because how many of you know you can start off strong, but you can run out of gas? You can lose your energy. You can get weak. So how do, we, how do we identify these three things that will sap us of energy, spiritual energy? And what can we do? What kind of commitments can we make to stay spiritually strong? Because we want to finish the race, not just start the race. When I was in junior high, I decided to, uh, to go out for track. Uh, I thought I was amazing. Of course, when you're 15, you think you're amazing, no offense, but you think you're amazing on everything. And so I went out for track, and, and I did pretty good the first time or two, but then they decided to run what they called the five mile something. All I know is I didn't know what five miles was. And uh, I, I, I got there, and anyways, I thought I was just gonna lay these guys in the, I looked at my competition, I thought, no problem. I'm a, I'm a, just leave these guys in the dust. They're going to eat my dust. Man, I started jogging, got out there in front of these guys. I was just way out in front of them. Tell about the third mile. About the third mile, it began to change. I began to feel weak, and I began to feel like I'm running out of gas. And then I looked over my shoulder, and these guys are catching up with me. And then there's this one, I'll never forget him, a little bitty guy. And he passed me up. It made me mad. How can that little bitty guy pass me up? So I tried the hardest to, to get up to him, and I couldn't. He just left me, and I'm eating his dust. Before I know it, this is no joke, every single person jogging, running that race passed me up. They were all waiting on me because I had kind of egged it on at the beginning, told them what I was going to do to them in this race. So they were all waiting for me at the finish line to tell me all about it. And they were talking about me and my mama and everybody else, and you know, and it's like, really? God doesn't want you just to start the race. He wants you to finish the race. He wants you to set out in this journey towards life change, but not to become weary and well-doing. He wants to, you to finish. How many of you know that God's called you to be a finisher? Tell somebody around you, say, God's called you to be a finisher. God's called you to be a finisher. A finisher. Because that's what Jesus did. He finished the race. Samson, let's talk about him. Let's look at his birth. We read this this morning. I'm going to read from the NIV. Judges chapter 13, here's his birth. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah, from the clan of the Danites, had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you're going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. No alcohol, a special diet. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor. <laughs> you know, when I was raised at, as a little boy at home, I wish I could have lived that because I tried to grow long hair in the late 60s, early 70s and we were Pentecostal and little boys had to shave their heads and uh, I'm bitter. <laughs> but it was right there. 
Anyways, whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite. He's going to take a Nazarite vow dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Okay, she becomes pregnant. Here's the promise of God. This guy's going to be amazing. This little boy you're going to have is going to be amazing. Look down at verse 24. The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew, and the Lord blessed him, and the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. The Spirit of the Lord, as a young man, began to stir him, and God began to do this amazing thing. He was very, very empowered by God. He starts well. In fact, early in life, he is doing these amazing things, but somewhere along the line, he starts to lose about the third mile. He starts to lose his energy. He starts to lose his strength. And I want to show you very quickly, there are three weaknesses that we have to overcome. In order, they're, they're common to all of us. But if we're going to stay strong, if we're going to be strong and stay strong, we have to overcome these three weaknesses that Samson dealt with. The first one is the weakness of indulgence. We read this today. It's, it's, uh, how many of you know that even good things can become bad things if we indulge in them? Too much TV. Too much food. Money can become, if you indulge, sex, if you indulge. You go down the list. Any good thing, alcohol, take anything that could possibly be good in moderation, take it to the extreme, and it becomes you indulge in it, it becomes destructive. The, the, the teachings of Scripture is it's not so much don't, don't, don't. It's, it's live a life of moderation. Learn to have self-control. Learn to say no. Let your no be no. Put boundaries on, on bad things, yes, but say put, put some, bad, some, some boundaries on the good things of life as well. So Samson had a weakness. What was it? Women. Three chapters. Y'all listening over here? Uh huh. Three chapters, three different women. And Samson kept, he's scared of relationships with these women. He loves them and then he bails out on them. He's afraid of commitment to a woman. Does that sound vaguely familiar? So, so he, he had this, you watch his whole life story, it was about women. And yet God used him in a, an amazing way. The Spirit of the Lord moved on him. He did things that were amazing. But his, his kryptonite, w w women. In Judges 14, we read it this morning, he sees a good-looking woman. And he says, oh, ooh, la, la, I got I to gotta have her to be my wife. So he goes to mom and dad, says, mom and dad, get her for me. I want her. She's the one. She is smoking hot. Mom and dad says, Samson, you're a Jew. She's a non-Jew. A good Jewish boy does not, no, no, we're not. He insists, get her for me. I want her now. It's the beginning of a pattern in his life. I gotta have it now, and I wanna indulge in it. Now, what was Samson's excuse here? Just this once. Just this once. It's not gonna hurt just this one time. Listen, I, I, I go fishing. Some of y'all know that. Watch me on social media, and I'll show you I go fishing. So I got you out on the lake with me in my boat. And we're out there in the middle, and I say to you, hey, I, you need to be aware of this. Nothing to be alarmed about, but, but my boat has a little leak in it. it. It's only a little leak. It's just like two inches, and it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. And I'm sure we can make it back to land safe. Right? You're looking at me going, dude, you better get me back there right now. Why? Because a leak is a leak. You know the devil would tempt you with this thought. You got that one little area of your life that's out of control you're indulging in. 
ah, it's no big deal. Don't worry about it. Listen, man, that, that's not just you. It's all of us. That's the human race. The enemy's always tempting you. Hey, just indulge in this one area. It's going to be okay. But we know this, that if you don't take care of that leak, it will ultimately sink your ship. And here's what happens the older you get. Listen, the older you get, the more people you have on your boat. And if you sink your boat when you're my age, there are tens of thousands of people on the boat. They go down with you. So you got to take care of this stuff as best as you can while you're your age. You're a young adult. And you're saying, okay, I got this one area, man, whatever it takes, go take care of that. Get counseling, talk to a pastor, get friends to, to hold you accountable, to whatever it takes so that you can live a life of self-control. Because if, if you don't, ultimately, we see this all the time, when a man of God, a woman of God, their ship sinks, and you go, wow. Man, they've been working on messing that up for a long time. They've had a leak in their boat for a long time. They didn't fix it. So what must we do to overcome this weakness? Here it is. Base my decisions on principle rather than pleasure. Base my decisions on principle rather than pleasure. If we don't, we're going to fall into self-indulgence. So God tells Samson, Samson, don't do it. You see that chick down in Timna? Mm -mm, don't you do it. Mom and dad said, don't you do it. And what does he do? He does it. Why? Because he listens to his glands instead of God's plans. <laughs> because he's listening to his appetites rather than what the Lord says. I love the sound from this side of the room. It's so awesome. He sees this woman and his convictions go out the door. He says, I just got, just got to have her. The Bible says, don't be misled. God's not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If I want to have a good harvest, I have to plant the right kind of seeds. So I choose, especially early in life, all the way through life, but especially early in life. You want a great harvest down the road, you've got to start planting the good seeds now. Okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing, to renew my strength and to, to stay strong, I must overcome Resentment. Everybody say resentment. This is, this is the one that will sap your spiritual energy faster than just about anything. Why? Because when you get angry, when you get mad, and you're going to strike back, it just pulls all the energy out of your soul. So we got to learn to overcome resentment. This guy, Samson, when you read his story tomorrow and today, he was constantly in a rage, wasn't he? He was always getting ticked off, and he was doing things to strike back and to get even at folks. I'm not going to get mad. I'm going to get even. Today we read about Samson killing 30 men just to get even on a bet. He killed 30 guys just to get even on a bet. I, I would say he needs some uh, recovery and anger management. Tomorrow you're going to read the story in Judges 15 about Samson. He marries another woman, this woman number two. He marries her. Then they have a domestic dispute, and he goes back home and lives with mama. Sound familiar? Anybody? <laughs> and while he's back at mom and dad's house, Father-in-law thinks that Samson's not coming back, so he gives away his daughter to Samson's best man at his wedding. Samson shows up, and he says to the father-in-law, he says, I can't help what I'm about to do. I'm going to break some heads. And he rages, he's out of control, he's angry, he's seeking revenge. What's his excuse this time? They hurt me first. I was raised in a home with five girls, and I was the only boy. And I was always getting in trouble because, you know, they pull my hair, I pull their hair. That's just the way we roll. 
but I was always the one who got caught. <laughs> but they did it first, and I'm just getting back. This is what Samson was doing, man. He was always striking back. I'm, you know, they hurt me first, so I'm, on, I'm, not, I'm, on, I'm gonna finish this thing. So to overcome this weakness of resentment, I must, here it is, base my choices on a response rather than a reaction. I must base my choice on a response rather than a reaction. Samson was always reacting in anger rather than responding. Watch this. The Bible doesn't say don't get angry, right? It says be angry, but don't sin. What does that mean? It means you respond to your anger rather than react to your anger. We have so much reaction and anger going on in our world. The reason why people are walking into places of worship and blowing people up. What's the deal? It's anger and hatred and people reacting to that in their, in their hearts and their lives. Yet the Bible says you're only hurting yourself with your resentment. If I, if I am full of resentment and anger and, and I'm ke keeping that stuff inside and, and you know, I, I'm going to just get even. Who am I hurting? I'm not hurting them as much as I'm hurting me. God says that resentment is a waste. Listen up. Resentment is a waste of your time. Because resentment keeps you stuck in your past. Resentment is also a waste of your energy because it's going to drain you emotionally. But it's also, listen, it's all, resentment is also a waste of your creativity. Isn't it amazing how creative we can become when we're seeking revenge? Yeah. Ooh, ooh. I, this is a true story. This lady, her husband cheated on her, and so he, he had a Mercedes out front, and when he came home from work, he wasn't in the Mercedes, but when he came home, the Mercedes was covered with green paint. Then he went into his closet, and all of his very expensive $1,000 suits had all the sleeves cut off of them. <laughs> then, then, the next morning, he brushed his teeth with his toothbrush, which she had scrubbed the commode with. <laughs> I, think, I think she's ticked. All this creativity. Think, think about Samson. Samson is, oh, he is such a creative genius to strike back at the enemy. You know what he does? He finds 300 pairs of foxes. And he ties their tails together in pairs. Then he puts a torch in between, tied into that tail. By the way, that's the first reference to tail lights in, in the Bible. <laughs> That was a good one. Come on. <laughs> and then he lights the torch and releases the foxes into the enemy's grain field and burns it down. All be it's kind of creative, right? But it was a waste of his creative energy. It makes me weak. The Bible says a fool, Proverbs 29, 11, a fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. All right, let's do one more. And this is a big one. If, if, I'm gonna, if I'm gonna stay strong in life and finish, finish well, strong, then I have to overcome the weakness of carelessness. Carelessness. Judges 16, you'll read it tomorrow. Samson gets very careless. Um, this time, Samson's excuse was, it will be different for me. It will be different for me. Let me ask you a question. When you're careless with your health, does it cost you? If you're careless with your money, does it cost you? It does, right? If you're careless with your words and you overpromise and underdeliver, it mess you up, right? So you don't want to miss this. There's power in your spoken word of when you give your word and you say, I promise I'm going to do this, and you do it. There's power when you keep your promises. On the other hand, when you become careless with, with your words and, and you promise things to God and to others and you don't follow through, that brings a weakness in your life as well. Samson made some commitments to God. 
The commitment was, remember his mom was told by the angel when she's going to give birth to him, says a razor should never come on his head and, and he, you should never drink alcohol. He won't drink alcohol and he's supposed to be on a, a special diet because that was called a Nazarite vow. A Nazarite vow was simply this. I'm going to dedicate my entire life. My entire life belongs to God, not to me. And so to remind me of that, every day of my life, I want to eat a certain diet that nobody else is, is, is eating. I'm not going to drink any alcohol while all the other Jewish people are drinking tequila. I'm drinking nothing. I'm drinking water with a little squeeze of lemon in there. And then I'm never going to cut my hair because every day I want to be reminded that I belong to God. He made that, that vow, that commitment, right? But did he keep his promise? By the way, this is a spoiler alert. So if you want to read this tomorrow, you need to plug your ears right now. Samson's commitments were the source of his strength, but he kept compromising his convictions. He kept compromising his promises. So what do we do to overcome carelessness? Base my life on commitments rather than convenience. Let me say it again. Base my life on commitments rather than convenience. Samson was careless in his commitment. Okay, so here's the third woman. Remember, he has this woman problem. The third one stole his heart. What's her name? Ooh, Delilah. Even the sound of her name is just, wow, that's awesome. Delilah. And she was a looker. I mean, this girl was. And when the Philistines found out that she and him were hooking up. They gave her 25 grand. They bribed her to find out the secret of his strength because they couldn't figure it out. And so she comes in and after a night of, let's call it frolicking. <laughs> That's the PG version. As a, after a night of frolicking, He's laying back there, has his head in her lap. She's, oh, Samson, you're so handsome. <laughs> Honey, can you tell me the secret of your, your strength? I won't tell nobody. And, she's, and he says, now watch what he does. He goes to toying with her, toying with temptation. He said, well, you know, if you, if you get the, the bows off of a bow and arrow and get seven of them, and tie me up, then, then I'll lose my strength. He falls off to sleep, wakes up in the middle of the night, and guess what he's got? He's bound up with these, the, these strings from the bow and arrow, seven of them, and he looks around, there's strange men in the room, and he breaks the, the, the ropes and then breaks their necks, kicks them out, Next night, this guy isn't too bright. Let me just tell you. Because the next night, after a night of frolicking, he's again laid back there. Ooh, Delilah, so pretty. Samson, you got to tell me the real secret of your strength. And he says, oh, I was just messing with you last night. This is the real secret of my strength is if you will bind me up with new ropes, new ropes, dumb boy goes to sleep wakes up in the middle of the night and he's got new ropes wrapped around his hands and there's strange men in the room and what does he do he breaks the ropes breaks their noses kicks them out get out of here night number three Delilah doing her thing oh Samson baby watch this Samson, baby, you were so strong. Oh, boy, you're so strong. Men, be very careful. Anytime she says to you, you're so strong. Because you have never been so weak in that moment. Not that I'm speaking from experience. Ooh, baby, baby. <laughs> Hear 
here's the secret of my strength, Delilah. You see my hair? If you'll braid my hair. If you braid my hair, then, I, then, then I'm going to lose my strength. I'll be like any other man. Notice how much closer he's getting to the truth. Now he's talking about his hair, the source of his strength. But it's braiding the hair. So what does she do? Yeah, go to sleep, little man. Go to sleep. Ooh, baby, baby. Wakes up in the middle of the night, and he's got all braided hair. And what does he, if there's a bunch of strange men in the room, what does he do? He gets up and beats them all up and undoes his braided hair and says, that looked kind of dumb there. I didn't like that anyways. And she's going to do it to him one more time? Watch how this works. This is what the devil does in trying to seduce you and me. He'll start here and get you to here and then to get you to here and get you to just get a little careless with this one area of my life. And then all of a sudden you're just saying, how close to the edge can I get without falling off the cliff? How, how close to the fire can I get without getting burned? Fourth night, she wore him down. Samson laying back here again. Ooh, baby, baby, you got it. Ooh, baby, baby. Y'all don't even know what that is, anyways. And Delilah says, Oh, come on, Sammy. You got to tell me the truth. You're killing me, guy. You're killing me. And he's broke down. He can't stand it no more. So what does he do? He says, Delilah, if my hair is ever cut, I will lose all my power. She's got him. He goes to sleep, wakes up in the middle of the night. His hair is all cut off. Looks like me. And he doesn't even know that his strength is gone. And the Bible says he gets up and he's going to do just like he'd done all these other times before. He's just going to whoop on him. I'm strong. He throws the first punch. He has no strength. He's become like some puny dude. Just a little, that little guy who ran past me all those years ago. I'm not bitter. And they take him. The end of the story comes down to this. Go to chapter 16. Go down to verse 17. No, I told you wrong. I don't know where I'm at. Chapter 17. 16, yeah? Yeah, thank you. That's what I don't like about electronics right there. Amen, amen, okay. All right, turn your phones off. Here we go. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head. Verse 17, he said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more. He, told, he has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands after putting him to sleep on her lap. She called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him and his strength left him. Then she called Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and, and shake myself free. But he did not know, he did not know that the Lord had left him. Yahweh, the God of Israel, had been with him his entire life and he did not even know in that second that God was gone. Then the Philistines seized him. Now watch what happens. Gouged out his eyes. See, that's what the devil do. He'll take your vision. And took him down to Gaza. Down. 
binding him with bronze shackles. They set him to grinding grain in the prison. So you got the picture. Come on, everybody look up here. Don't want, don't want to lose you. Come here. Because I'm going to give you the punchline and we'll be done. He's in prison. His eyes are gone. He's a weak dude. But then he does something that we all can do when we lose our strength. Pray again. Say, God, I want to feel your spirit one more time. God, I want to be strong again in my soul. Verse 28. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more. And let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two center pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against it. His right hand on one, his left on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all of his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and on all the people. Thus he killed many more when he died than when he lived. Listen, it ain't over till it's over. With God, God is always the God of the second chance and the third chance and the thousandth chance. And when you pray, God, let me just restore me, God, one more time. Restore my strength. Restore my spiritual vitality. God will put his spirit in you one more time. It's not over till it's over. And this man, after he had his greatest failure, had his greatest success. All because at his lowest, when he felt like a total failure, full of shame, he remembered that God is a God of love and God will restore him. And I'm telling you right now, some of you feel that way tonight. Some of you feel this way. You've gone too far. You've done too much. At one time you walked in spiritual strength and closeness to God, but you've drifted away and maybe, you know, Wine, women, or wealth, I don't know. You take one of them. The excess of any three of those is going to take you down. And some of you have, have gone too far, but I hear Jesus saying to you, pray the prayer of Samson. Remember me, Lord. One more time, let me feel your touch. One more time, let me feel your spirit. One more time, empower me with the Holy Spirit. so that I can finish well. How many of you want to have more strength, more vitality, more energy of the Holy Spirit? Yeah? Let's bow our heads. I feel the Holy Spirit so powerfully in this moment. Which of these three areas has the devil been trying to make you weak with. For some of us, it's self-indulgence. Not necessarily bad things, but good things that just too much of. Self-indulgence. And you hear the Holy Spirit saying to you, make sure you stay a person of moderation. Maybe some of you in this moment right now will just pray, cry out to God, say, God, I, I know in this one area of my life, I'm out of control. I'm out of control, Lord. And I need you to help me to get control. And I can't do it myself, Jesus. It may be a, a woman thing, a man thing. It could be a porn thing. I don't know what it is, but it could be a money thing. It could be a food thing. It could, it, but it's out of control in your life. And you're, you just got to cry out to God right now and say, God, Lord Jesus, I need your help. And he's filling you right now with his spirit to give you self-control. Is it resentment? Is that the weak link in your life? Resentment, bitterness. Would you choose right now to free yourself by forgiving that person? 
choose right now to say, I am tired of keeping this unforgiveness, this bitterness in my heart. I choose to forgive my mom or my dad or my wife or husband or my boyfriend or girlfriend. I choose to forgive the boss. I choose to forgive the person that's hurt me. And you'll get your strength back through forgiveness. And then for some of you, it's carelessness. You've allowed some slippage in your commitment to Christ. You bought into the lie. I can handle it. I can handle it. It won't bother me. You've been flirting with something that is wrong in your life. And, and tonight God is not condemning you, but he is convicting you. He's convicting me. Saying, don't get careless. Return to me. Return to making promises to God and keeping them and saying, Lord, I can't do it on my own, but I can do it through you. Come back to him today. Samson the playboy becomes Samson the prophet in the end of, a day, of his days because God raised him up from his brokenness and his shame. I don't know who you are, sir or ma'am, that you've gone so far. You really feel you have gone too far. You're, you're, there's shame. But God's raising you up today. He's raising you up. He's restoring your vision for life. He's restoring the, the confidence that God loves you. Holy Spirit, would you move right now in that person's heart? I don't know who they are. But they've stopped believing that you have a plan for their lives because they've really messed up. Restore them, Lord. I want us to stand, please, all over the room. Join hands with the person beside you, and if you don't mind bridging the aisles. I've had a lot of fun with uh, the youth that was here tonight. Thank you guys so much. You guys are a lot of fun to talk to. But I want to just talk to you seriously for a second. You are our hope. And you, these young adults, is the seeds of greatness, the seeds to change our world. Listen very carefully. I just shared this story with the seniors who are graduating. I, I met with them before this, this gathering. I was 17 years old when God called me to do what I'm doing now. And I was the least likely to succeed. I stuttered when I talked. But at 17, God's spirit filled me. And God called me. And I've been following that calling now for 40 years. Listen, listen. Some of you feel like I could never do this, can't do that because you just don't know my family, you don't know my background, whatever. But I want to tell you something. The same Holy Spirit that anointed me, the same Holy Spirit that called me, is the same Holy Spirit that has a calling on your life, an anointing, a grace to change your world. God is raising up prophetic voices, modern-day prophets and apostles. They're right here. Right here. You're going to change your world. I want to pray the Spirit of God to fill you. So close your eyes. All of you, let's close your eyes. But specifically on every young person. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we as parents and spiritual fathers and mothers of the faith, over you we release the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray that Jesus would keep your hearts, keep your souls safe from the evil one who would try to destroy your life before it even begins. Right now, right here, I pray that the Holy Spirit would fill you, that you would be anointed from heaven, that you would dream God's dream for your life. I want the rest of us now to pray and ask God for an infilling of the Holy Spirit. 
As sincerely as you know how to ask that prayer, I want you to say, God, I want, I can't, like Samson, I cannot do life apart from your Holy Spirit. I need your breath in my lungs. I need your breath on my face. I need the wind of heaven. Come now, Jesus. Tell the Lord, say, Jesus, I'm open. Just fill me up right now. Some of you have been emptied out because of life, because of discouragement. You've been emptied out of spiritual vitality, but the fire of heaven is falling right now on you. God, I ask that you would move right now on every heart, on every heart. Fill them with the Holy Spirit. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heavenly armies. God is filling you right now with his presence. Say, Jesus, I, I want to be empowered by heaven. Jesus, I want to be empowered by heaven. Jesus, lay your hand on me tonight and anoint me afresh. Fill me with your spirit right now. One last thing I want to ask you. Some of you here tonight and you have went backwards in your faith. And until tonight you didn't even realize how far you drifted from your faith. That deep love affair with Jesus, the passion for God, the passion for the things of God. But tonight, tonight you'd say, James, I'm, I'm making my way back. Just like Samson, I'm making my way back. If that is you, just everybody drop your hands right now. Just drop your hands. If that is you right now, you say, James, I'm making a recommitment to my God tonight to follow him with my life. If that is you, I want you to raise up your hand all over the room. Let me see who you are. Yeah, don't be ashamed, man. We've all been there. I've been there many times myself. Yeah, keep them up. Father, you see these hands that are raised right now, and I pray that your love would flood their souls. Your love would pursue them. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. You're going to pursue every one of us. And Lord, those that have their hands raised, may they be filled with new love from heaven, the expression of your love to them. Oh God, may they feel close to you right now. Embrace them, Father. Embrace them. New beginnings tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, 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 amen. Let it be, Jesus.